everybody, it's Eric Johnson from Airtay Throws Nation, and in this video, what we're going to talk about is Love the Grind. What is Love the Grind? It's our new podcast, and we're really, really fortunate to kick off our first podcast with 2019 world champion Joe Kovacs and his amazing coach wife, Ashley Kovacs. So in this short segment, about 10 minute clip, we go through some different things, a little bit about Ashley's background. We go through some coaching questions, kind of mindset, the qualification process, and what was leading up into how the preparation, kind of some of the behind the scenes stuff that many of you probably find very interesting. If you listen carefully, Ashley has some really great coaching nuggets as they talk about how they prep for the world championships and kind of how they planned to execute the competition. And it didn't go quite as planned, but clearly it worked out well. So check out this video and enjoy Love the Grind. I'll tell you, when you asked, you just brought up the qualifier for me. I'll be brutally honest. I hate the qualifying round more than anything. I probably did something that was crazy, especially if people who know me and know me about warming up and how many warm ups I've taken. And so I was like, well, oh, man, that's like a normal me. I'm not, I'm not even worried at all. And I actually only took one pool and they cut us off at the three. It was a little unfair that one group got more than the other. Thanks so much for uh, you guys doing this. Again, we're getting our podcast going, kind of an extension of what we do with our program. And we're just trying to get a little bit more into the mindset of what it takes for athletes to kind of obviously get to your level as a very unique mindset. And as we did some research, it, it seems like you guys are definitely a very good match you know, l learning a little bit more about both your personalities. Joe, you and I actually have a few things in common. One, we work with our wives. My wife's my partner, actually, in my business and our business. We both uh, obviously worked with Art Venegas. My wife actually helped with some of the research and um, she was like, I can't believe you're not best friends with this guy. <laughs> and obviously, you guys are have to be like the biggest power throwing couple. I mean, there's like John Smith and Connie and there was like Ramona Pagel and, you know, Know, Kent Pagel and there's been some husband wives, but I don't, nobody's ever won a world championship together. So I will start out with Ashley and I will try to make this cohesive as possible. So now you've been the coach, I believe for two U.S. national teams now, NACAC, and this year you were the throws coach for the worlds or you were helping with preparation. So yeah, I was throws coach for the world team for the men. 2018, I did NACAC in 2017. I did junior Pan Ams for the women. And then I did did NACAC senior women, and then I did the world championships for the men. Okay, so this is basically four world teams at this point. So three, so Pan Am juniors, women, NACAC senior women, world men. Looking at that, obviously you've had a very impressive career as a coach. And so you've had, you know, to go through the list, like I said, what, what we'll do is kind of dive into to some of the information, more questions, but you've won all kinds of honors. Like uh, you were Great Lakes region coach. You, that was the second time you've won that, right? right. Sade was the female athlete of the year for the Big Ten. Obviously she had just this huge indoor with the weight. You were crushing it. I, you've coached multiple 20 meter guys. Obviously as a coach, having a ton of success. You yourself obviously were a very accomplished thrower. So now if I had this right, you were you threw 50 feet in high school, right? With the shot? 50 feet, 10 and a half. Yeah. As a glider. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, One yeah, sixty-two in the disc. Right. So you're kind of like a legend in Ohio. So returning to the the state and coaching at Ohio State, is there any any other place you're gonna rather want to coach? Yeah, I mean I mean probably not. You know, I mean it's kind of like the Mecca for for Ohio for sure to end up at Ohio State and an Ohio kid. No, that's awesome. So you were an 11 time all SEC honors athlete. You competed in two Olympic trials, 2008, 2012. Let's see, you were the, what, the NCAA runner up in the 2010 indoor in the shot. Yeah. The correct. Yeah. You competed in a few meets post collegially then after the trials in 2012 and 13. And you were fourth at the US indoors in the women's shot, obviously. And then um, you went to North Canton, right? That was it, Hoover yeah. High School. Three time state champion. Mm -hmm. So you were yeah. you were a pretty good thrower. <laughs> I was good. I guess I was good at that time. The other interesting thing though about and I don't know if you want to mention this from being from North Canton, I went to Joe Logan's high school. Ah, okay. So Very yeah, cool. so that's kind of like unique. Like I went to prom with Judd's son. So I, oh, wow. I was like, I always tell everybody I knew Judd Logan before I knew what the hammer was. That's the that's truth. pretty funny. Yeah. Right. And then another thing, so my first master's was in human development and leadership, but I just finished my second one at Ohio State in sports coaching. So that yeah. that might be kind of notable just because I did, I'd say I definitely learned some things in that one that have been helpful. Okay. Yeah, that was going to be, that's one of my questions later on. How's your- yeah, I saw that 
on the notes, so I was just... He's, he's got the format. Stick to it, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, at any rate, introducing Joe. Obviously, Joe, again, the list of accomplishments are pretty incredible. Two-time world champion, Olympic silver medalist, also, so technically a three-time world medalist, two-time world champion, two-time U.S. champion. So, needless to say, I could go on about how many pro meets you've gone to and the, and all the U.S. teams you've made and all that kind of stuff, but what I figure we do is dive into some questions and uh, get to that. So, not too slight, you know, it seems like you've done a thing or two as a shot putter, <laughs> and so we will We'll uh, kind of go from there. Let's see. Doha. I figured that's the, we'll get the monkey off our back and we'll talk about obviously that performance. I think there's some very unique things in terms of as a coach, how you how you would feel about that. And then obviously as the athlete. And so then there's this added element that not only is this the athlete you're coaching, this is your husband. And so there has to be some extra, like I would imagine some extra anxiety or maybe not. Obviously you you hit the auto qualifier in the qualifying round, right? And it was just pretty much you were, I think you did it on the first throw, right? Yeah. So if you, if you I'll even get into detail on that too. So um, I went through a lot of changes, at least when I came out here. I'll tell you, um, to recap Doha, it, it, you kind of have to recap the whole the whole process of getting there. Okay. She was named the coach in November around this time last year for okay. the Doha team. I was super excited for her, but at the same time, as you know, USA's isn't easy and I had to punch that ticket. So we weren't really able to kind of celebrate that fully until I got that done in, in Des Moines. So it was definitely exciting just to be there in Doha with her, knowing that she was going to be there. By the time we got to Doha, just to sum it up, like we kind of hit the ground running. She had to be there early because she was the team coach. So I got hit there, there the same time she did. Um, we strung together some of the best training I think I've ever done in my life. Not really crazy distance, though they were pretty good, but it was more like the mindset, kind of reading my body. I'll tell you when you, asked, you just brought up the qualifier for me, I'll be brutally honest. I hate the qualifying round more than anything. So once we got through that, it was uh, a definitely a breath of fresh air. We'll go into details about it. Like I probably did something that was crazy, especially if people who know me and know me about warming up and how many warm ups I've taken. And everybody talks to me about how many warm ups I took in Rio, and they think it was crazy outside the stadium. I didn't take any throws outside the stadium before qualifying, <laughs> which was yeah, it's a little bit of a risk and gamble. But you know, the, the 2090 is the automatic qualifier. I like to think I can pretty much do that you know, within three throws. This was the first time that the A and the B group weren't going at the same time. Normally, it's two rings at once, and they let them go. Mm. Because there's a long throw going on, it went A and then B. So I actually heard that the A group got five throws in the ring for warm-ups. So I was okay. like, well, oh, man, that's like a normal me. I'm not... I'm not even worried at all. Okay. So by the time I got out there, I did two stand throws, kind of just to start warming up, assuming I'm going to have three fulls. And I actually only took one full, and then they cut us off at three. So, I mean, to be honest, I was a little ticked off because it was a little unfair that one group got more than the other. Yeah. But, I mean, you kind of just have to roll with it at this point. But I know she's sitting in the stands, and, you know, ultimately, it was something I wanted to do, but it was her decision. And I would not have agreed to do it unless we did it. We jointly made that decision. But, yeah, that's a little bit of a gamble to go into that qualifying round without seeing and having the confidence of seeing where the ball is going. After I took the first throw, I saw it just squeak past that line. And once I saw 92, I mean, I didn't care how far it was. You right. know, when you hit that big Q, it was the biggest relief. So was there any added stress, the fact that you did take the one warm-up throw and then now you're like, well, wait a minute, I don't get a couple more. And so did it add a little bit? Yeah, like unnecessarily, just because you're planning on it. I mean, I'm at the point now where I'm trying, you know, I, I think I roll with things pretty well. If you get shut down, well, we can deal with it. I would be extra mad if that was the final and we and it was under different circumstances. But yeah, I mean, I like asked the official, you know, I, I was like, hey, the other group got five and they're like, oh, we're running late on time we're gonna cut you down for me i just kind of rolled with it at that point because you have to at these meets like the most important thing is to not have a routine but as long as you can kind of check your checklist off and you feel confident kind of feel good to go so i don't know if it was more pressure but i know ashley in the stands that might have made her been a little bit more on edge just because of the plan we had you know most guys coming in there were warmed up outside the stadium and coming in the call room yeah obviously have to wait a while but they were maybe a little bit more advantage because they kind of came into that scenario a little bit different than I did okay. but ultimately I think it was definitely worth it and who who were the main throwers in your qualifying group 
I forgot uh, at the time I looked, but sure. Uh, Krauser was in mine. You know, I'll tell you, uh, Bob from Luxembourg who didn't make it was in mine because I remember seeing him throw outside the sector a few times. Oh, the other pull, Heretic was Heretic, in mine, yep. and okay. you know, th- those were kind of two casualties not having those two twenty-two meter guys make it. But luckily, you know, it's probably good I don't remember because I only took one throw and got out. It's <laughs> bad if you remember who's there because that means you're sticking around watching the other two throws. Yeah, exactly. And so for you, Ashley, was there any like, okay, wait, you you did you go into that too as the coach thinking, oh, we'll we'll go through. I always know as the right as the coach, it's always gotta be like, oh yeah, everything's fine, even though you might be dying inside. <laughs> you can't tell your athlete, holy shit, like I'm stressed. It's like, yeah, yeah, it's a, it's no big deal. So d- did you have any of that too? Like, were you worried at all since he only got the one full throw in qualifying? Yeah, I didn't like it. I knew that they were cutting it close on time and I I knew too that it was going to be dependent upon like how quickly the guys walked like through the tunnel to get to the stadium Mm -hmm. I just knew there were going to be a lot of variables because they had that hard start time and so I was getting a little bit worried because the way that the guys came out all at once it was just kind of like a lot of chaos and they didn't get into the ring right away Mm -hmm. and then that made me feel like okay they're not going to have as much time as I thought that they were so like I timed the warm-ups for like every throwing event just to be sure I said to him I think that you're going to get around five throws and that was kind of like what everybody thought so so the fact that they only got three, I was definitely stressing out about that a little bit. His first full throw was pretty good, but I just, I know that in the past he's really judged himself for the day based off how his warmups were. So I was a little bit apprehensive about that, but luckily Joe came through in veteran fashion and, and saved us on that one because <laughs> I would have been feeling it for sure. I, I should know too, like we were practicing, you know, you are guaranteed two throws of a major championship. So we were practicing and had the mindset we're going to get two throws. It was only after her watching everybody, because she was a team coach, everybody get multiple throws that were like well you know we can keep okay. on going um, to be honest tom walsh opening up a 75 feet i wasn't shocked by that because you know when that happened i was ready for that.